Hello and welcome to World City, a global community of placemakers and city builders who are shaping the cities of tomorrow. My name is Chris Fair. I'm the president of Residence, a global advisor in tourism, economic and urban development for destinations, cities and developers around the world. We started World City in 2020 as a first of its kind virtual around the world event to connect cities and communities together during a time when our world was literally being turned upside down. Since then, we've grown into a group of more than 8,000 professional placemakers over the last three years that come from more than 80 different countries. And I'm delighted to have all of you joining us today for our first World City Summit, one of three we'll host this year as we lead up to the Global Forum this fall in New York City on October 2nd, 3rd and 4th. Please take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat, who you are, where you're joining from today. Um, this event is as much about creating an opportunity to connect with each other as it is about the conversation between the experts we have joining us today. Our goal for these summits was shaped by input from many of you to gather our community together more frequently and dive deeper into some of the critical themes and frameworks with World City fellows and experts to equip you with the provocations, tools, and connections to accelerate urban innovation in your own work and cities wherever you are in the world today. Today, we're gonna to be exploring what it takes to be an innovative city, cutting beneath the wordplay of innovation and into the placemaking policies and economic underpinnings of innovative cities and innovation districts. I can't think of anyone better to kick off this particular conversation um, then Bruce Katz, and we're delighted to have him joining us here today. Unfortunately, Bruce's camera's ha having some issues on the technical side, but we do have Bruce here uh, via voice. Uh, Bruce is the co-founder of New Localism Advisors and regularly advises global, national, and municipal leaders on reforms and innovations that advance the well-being of metropolitan areas and their countries. Much of his work focuses on the rise of cities and city networks as the world's leading problem solvers. Uh, welcome, Bruce. Glad to have you join us today. Well, thanks for having me, Chris. And I um, decided to do a radio interview today, so <laughs> on television. That's so, all right. Uh, the words are the most important in terms of the, the conversation. I think, you know, I wanted to start off and just talking about, you know, innovation. It's a big word. It's thrown around all the time, quite loosely. Uh, when we talk about cities and innovation, how do you define that or what defines an innovative city um, from your perspective? Well, I think the bottom line is we start with what Jeremy Nowak and I wrote about in the New Localism, which is that cities are not governments. They're, they're networks of private, public, philanthropic, university, community, labor leaders. Um, and that's why they are the problem solvers in the world. So if you think about the hard challenges in the world, um, whether it's climate, whether it's economic competitiveness, whether it's inclusion and equity, we're gonna need product innovation, we're gonna need process innovation, we're gonna need policy innovation, we're gonna need financial innovation. Where's that gonna happen? We may be doing some of these things with federal and state investments and investments from major financial institutions, but the hard work happens in cities. The prototyping of solutions, uh, the codifying of innovations, the, the scaling and replicability and adaptation of that both in countries and around the world. So I think cities are the vanguard of innovation, but innovation at multiple levels. I think a large, you know, a lot of time we have almost this technology view that is just about products. That's really important, but it's also about process, policy and finance. And as you think about the innovation economy in general, obviously you're you know based in the U.S. So you know, kind of starting maybe from a U.S. perspective, and then kind of give us the global perspective. Uh, you know, what's happening, or how do you define the innovation economy first of all, and what are some of the key trends that you see that are happening, or things that have maybe changed pre-post COVID in the in the landscape we find ourselves in today in 2023. Well, I think we're seeing a, a restructuring of domestic and global economies in the aftermath of COVID. Um, COVID disrupted supply chains. Um, that is leading to reshoring of production. Whenever you have production in a domestic economy, innovation is going to be baked into that. Um, manufacturing is one of the most innovative um, sectors in any economy. 
It's going through constant iterative change. Now, in the current environment, um, we're not just seeing a reshoring of production. We're also seeing a decarbonization of the economy. So the energy we produce, the buildings we occupy, the products we consume, um, the, the, the actual design of our communities is undergoing radical change. Um, some of the solutions we know and understand, and we can begin to adapt and replicate across cities and countries. Others, I think we're going to see a step change in innovation um, over the coming years. The last thing I'll say, and this is from an American perspective, uh, this may be the most important change, but it's hard to talk about, is geopolitical tensions because of the war in the Ukraine, because of this um, competition between China and the United States and other major economies. That is leading to a national security imperative on top of supply chain issues, on top of climate change, to try to reshore production, particularly in the semiconductor sector, um, and, and have this you know, virtuous um, sort of cycle between production and innovation um, in concentrated parts of our countries. So the, the economy circa 2023 and beyond does not look like the economy in, in 2019. Uh, this is a very different game we're about to play and cities and metropolitan areas and their regions are at the vanguard of it and the question the challenge to these places is to understand their position in this shifting dynamic and then take steps um, across multiple dimensions um, whether it's site acquisition and development for manufacturing whether it's environmental remediation whether it's centers of excellence and research and commercialization whether it's the skilling of workers to participate in this new economic order, the list goes on and on. This is a very complicated period, but cities and metros are where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. Of course, that rubber needs to be now sustainably developed. Um, and, and, um, and I do think for those places that can get organized across sectors and adapt to this new, this new world order, this could set a platform for the next 25 years of inclusive and sustainable growth. So obviously, you know, what you're speaking to, you know, when we think about innovation, I think we tend to think about tech and the tech sector, obviously we've you know, seen a, a lot of layoffs there. Of course, through the pandemic, we saw, you know, outflow of people from places, some of our superstar cities like, you know, San Francisco. How, if the definition of the innovation economy is evolving and changing to include these other sectors, how do you think that plays out in terms of the geography of the innovation economy? Are we going to see kind of a return to a handful of superstar cities really gaining most of the gains um, in terms of development and innovation? Or does the geography of where innovation happened both in the U.S. and internationally change as the innovation economy evolves and changes? Well, I think innovation has been narrowly defined in the past. I mean, very narrowly defined. And, and, and therefore, you know, in the United States in particular, um, it led to sort of a, a superstar city, superstar metro kind of phenomenon, um, which has a lot of social dynamics because of these spatial disparities be between prosperous cities and cities that are left behind. It also led to a lot of political disruption. I mean, I think the, the, the spatial disparities in the U.S. and in other parts of the world uh, really unravel um, sort of a sense of the common good and the ability to have stable functioning democracies. And so I think what is happening now because of this focus on manufacturing and production um, is we're getting a broader vision of innovation, um, broader vision of technology that undergirds a lot of innovation um, because of the focus on inclusion and equitable development. Um, you know, we're, we're even broadening out beyond, you know, conventional technology driven definitions um, to some of the process and financial innovation that I was describing before. I do think that there's an opportunity here to, to use a British term, level up, uh, to really see 
places that were not succeeding in this narrowly defined innovation economy pre-COVID to now find their right footing. Now you can see this in places like Michigan that are seeing an electrification of the auto sector, decarbonization of logistics. Um, they're beginning to see the possibilities that come from that tran industrial transformation to have their cities participate, their counties participate in a major way and to have it undergirded in a very tight industry academy relationship in centers of excellence in innovation districts. Um, so I don't think we totally understand yet what the upheaval caused by the pandemic and these geopolitical transitions and the, the rapid transition to, you know, to a climate friendly world. I don't think we quite understand yet what this means for places. But the short term, because of remote work, is that central business districts in our superstar cities have been dramatically compromised and eroded. That is leading to radical drops in transit ridership, radical drops in small business activity around traditional office districts, tax revenue effects. None of that has really been really understood at its full level yet because the federal government has stepped in sort of uh, with a lifeline essentially over the past several years. But as this decade plays out, and it's really important for people to think about not a year return to normal. This is a new disorder. It's a new economic order. I think over the next decade for cities and metros that can understand their special assets and advantages and concentrate, and this is where innovation districts come in, concentrate the relationship between mature companies, startup scale-ups, research institutions, investors, workers. This could set a whole new platform for inclusive and sustainable growth. But this is, you know, the feds, the federal government, central governments are not going to basically drive this. This is bottom up. The investments can, may come from above, but, the, but smart, intelligent, economy shaping, talent preparing, is going to happen at the local level. So I want to dive into a little bit more around innovation districts in a moment, but you're kind of speaking to this redistribution of innovation and some of the benefits of the growth of the innovation economy from a geospatial perspective. But what is the future, as you touched on a little bit, or do you think the impact for those superstar cities? I mean, you're in New York today or, or San Francisco that have, were most disrupted by the pandemic. Do we see them return back to where they were or does the future look somewhat different? I mean, these there were 10 cities in the US, for example, that were control, basically responsible for a third of the economic output of the you know, entire country. London by itself was responsible you know, for more than a quarter of the entire UK economy. Are we going to go back to that? Or what's, what happens with these cities, as you mentioned, that had these strong central business districts um, that were really powering the, the global economy in this new landscape? I don't think we're going back to that. You know, the, you know, the, this is a story about uh, the higher you flew, you know, the deeper you'll fall, and and it's going to be hard to dig out of this. Um, what we what we're now seeing is that central business districts, in in the terms of the language of Rob Stokes from Australia, are becoming central social districts. We need to radically diversify uses within these cores. Uh, we need to be thinking about conversion of office to residential for sure. We need to be thinking about innovation campuses within these um, cores. Some of some of what some of that's already happened in a Phoenix because of Arizona State moving into the downtown or um, or in you know Durham, North Carolina with Duke moving into their core. I mean we're gonna have to think about the role and the function of these places in very different ways. And then all this federal infrastructure money in the US is going to have to be put in the service of that. Because if you're going to reconfigure the purpose of a place, of a geography, you need to be thinking about roads, about transit, about water, about electricity, um, around broadband. I mean, layers of infrastructure that ultimately need to be aligned, even if they're vertically driven by separate government agencies. So. I think we're in a in a decade of almost a, a radical transition here, um, and 
you know, I think generally speaking, because of large amounts of rescue money, it's masked the deep shifts that are about to happen. I do think the, the large superstar cities are going to continue to play a major role. But, but because we're now diversifying your economy and really going through this burst of industrial and innovation transition, I think more cities and metro, if they step up, I mean, again, none of this is, is inevitable, right? There is not a federal agency of the United States that's getting up every morning and saying, hey, what about, you know, Detroit or what about St. Louis or what about Oklahoma City? At the end of the day, the national government, even states are responsible for setting a platform. Cities and metros and their networks of leaders um, and and residents are responsible for then finding their particular niche and playing it out to its fullest. So I, I, I do think that, you know, we're in a period where agency at the local level is paramount, absolutely paramount. And if we, if we, you know, pursue that thread, I think we'll end up with more, with less spatial disparity and hopefully more, um, sort of distribution of economic prosperity across the country. And wouldn't that be a good thing, you know, in terms of we are talking about how to create, you know, more inclusive economy, how do we create and drive economic development into uh, other areas, as you said, leveling up, as they call it in the UK, um, how do we do that across the US, the UK and, the, and other cities, other countries? What does that stepping up look like if we kind of drill down into thinking we have a lot of architects, designers, urban planners, you know, here uh, at the summit today. If I'm thinking about creating an innovation district, I mean, you really delve deep into this term more than a, a decade ago. How is the definition of what makes up an innovation and district evolved in your mind in response to these trends over the last 10 years? Well, you know, Julie Wagner and I identified this, and Julie's gone on to head uh, the Global Institute on Innovation Districts. And if there's one website that anyone on this um, webinar should should click on, it's the Global Institute on Innovation Districts website, giid.org. Um, uh, and you know, so maybe you should just stop listening to me and just look at the website. <laughs> but I mean, I, I I will say that when Julie and I put together the rise of innovation districts back almost a decade ago, we were thinking about this interplay of economic assets and physical assets, the place, um, place making a piece of this and, and the network assets. And I, I, I do think that what has happened is this restructuring of the economy. Uh, and this radical transition um, to a climate friendly economy uh, puts even more emphasis on these kinds of relationships and connections and synergies between the business world, whether they're mature companies, startups, scale ups, the research world, which in the US is obviously undergirded by large volumes of research dollars from NIH and NSF and the Department of Defense and the Department of Energy. And all of this is sort of pulled together in this um, physical place that basically supports collisions and supports the serendipity um, of interaction between people from different disciplines and different sectors. That's what makes innovation districts hum. It's a notion that innovation, whether it's product, whether it's process, whether it's financial, is not a solo act. It's not, you know, this whole mythology of someone going into their garage in Silicon Valley, you know, and, and magically creating the product that will transform the world. That's just sort of nonsense. I mean, I, you know, complete utter nonsense. It's, it makes great television, makes great for great movies. It's not the way the world works. You know, the world works from um, what makes cities work is just the ability to be you know, interacting with people from very different walks of life who together can pull together um, for the next generation of the economy. So that's what's happening now. And I, I, I think innovation districts in some respects are in their early stage, because if you take climate, for example, we should be creating innovation hubs that are testing, prototyping, 
whole new ways of basically driving um, economies towards net zero. It's, it's not going to happen in isolated labs. It's going to happen in the real world. And so innovation districts, I think, are going to increasingly become places for testing, you know, test labs of sorts at much bigger scales than we've ever imagined. So I think we're early days here, frankly. I think we were spotting a trend pre-COVID, which I think, you know, I think captures the way innovation actually happens. You know, in the 50s and the 60s of the last century, the U.S., in particular, tended to have innovation labs out of sight, out of mind, you know, in secure facilities, often some exurb. I mean, it would be hard to even find these places because we didn't have GPS at the time, right? But, but now I think we're going to find either the cores of cities, the midtowns of cities. This is really where we're going to see the flourishing of a sort of a new wave of, of, of really diverse uses um, and, and really complex mashups of different sectors of our economy in these quality places. This should be a time for, uh, for experimentation. It's not like there's a cookie cutter here that we just take off the shelf. Hey, apply this, you know, recipe in your own city and, you know, wait three years and see what happens. I think this is a, a time for particularly the people on this call, architects, engineers, placemakers, all the, you know, housers, all the rest to say, hey, let's, Let's see if our city can jump ahead of the pack through some really innovative practices and relationships and partnerships. Oop, um, I have lost the your your uh, unbelievably. I've lost hearing you. Can you hear me? Sorry, yes, I can hear you fine. Sorry, oh, you're back. Yeah. I'm good. Sorry, a little cut out there. Um, you know, it strikes me as you talk about the innovation economy and the uh, landscape and how that's evolved and changed. I think as we thought about in design and work with developers on innovation districts in the past, it was very tech oriented. You know, essentially creating places for coding. Uh, but now as you think about this more multi-dimensional aspect to the innovation economy and the definition of it, energy transition, you know, life sciences, you know, reshoring of manufacturing, it strikes me that all of these types of innovation require a lot of physical space. I mean, what's your kind of perspective in terms of remote work and innovation and how the innovation economy evolves and what our needs might be in terms of the types of physical spaces that we should be thinking about? Well, I, you know, the one thing for everyone on this call to think about is these innovation districts and how they relate to other parts of your city, county and metropolitan and even regional economy. So innovation districts are not hermetically sealed. You know, it's not like we create non-porous walls around them and say, OK, innovation is just going to happen here everyone outside the wall good luck i mean basically what these are platforms for large scale innovative activity production activity prototyping activity all across metropolitan and regional economies so um you may have sort of this hothouse of innovation particularly around products that occur in the shadow of advanced research institutions where you have an enormous amount of commercialization and industry academy campuses um, in the US and elsewhere, but then go out to other parts of the city or the county or the metro. And that's where you may have larger scale production facilities, logistics that are undergoing changes, um, community colleges and technical institutes that are preparing workers for occupation, some of which we could not even imagine five or 10 years ago at the scale they're going to be at. So these are interesting geographic connections that occur. You know, the hubs may be concentrated in the cores around these advanced institutions and mature companies and startup and scale ups, but then they radiate out. Um, inevitably into their metropolitan economy space um, for a whole bunch of different land reasons and 
you know, commuting patterns and all the rest of it. So I think innovation districts at times are seen as almost like an isolated enclave, you know, of brainiacs, I suppose, <laughs> sort of like cooking up the new stuff. Actually, if they're going to be successful, they're part of a very intricate web of, of companies and researchers and workers. Many of those workers actually don't require, or the occupations don't require four-year degrees. They require credentialing, they require certificates. It really sort of elevates the, the role of community colleges and technical institutes. So for the folks on the phone, there's the innovation district work itself, but then there are these just web of connections um across geographic space in city and metropolitan and regional areas and that's where the magic happens i mean when you really are able to to sort of unveil those dynamics and strengthen them and you'll see this in the aerospace sector you'll see this in the automotive sector you'll see this in semiconductors across any of the advanced industries all the climate related in, innovations it's not going to be like one you know 200 acre site or 500 acre site, those places do need to be created and, and curated. But it's the broader metropolitan landscape that I think we need to be understanding more clearly. And federal money in the US and state funding, I think is gonna be critical to sort of sharpen um, um, at those, those relationships. Yeah, so I think as we think about the, you know, the innovation district as maybe just one node our yep. center point within our, our regional innovation economy. And I think you know, to what you're speaking to is we see a lot of that in the data as we just look at the explosion of new businesses that have been registered over the last three years. Um, they're still clustered, but they're quite spread out, whether that's around Atlanta or it's around a Chicago or it's around a London or, or New York or in Florida. Um, so we're starting to see these potential kind of regional almost network uh, type economies evolving and Maybe the innovation district is just one node that connects all of these different companies and individuals together. Um, do you see this being an opportunity? There's actually you know, a question here from our audience as we think about for rural, more rural areas, like how do they connect into these you know, regionalization or these regional innovation economies? Well, it's a great question. I mean, the one thing about the United States, which is quite interesting, is the way we define metropolitan areas as commuter sheds you know, like what portion of your of people in a particular county commute across county lines to work. That's the traditional definition of metropolitan areas. That sweeps in half of rural America. So we talk about rural and urban America as if they're completely separate. Actually, they're all you know, part of large metropolitan areas just because of sprawl and decentralization. So the rural areas have a, a very important role to play as we make this transition to a net zero economy for, for energy reasons, for food reasons, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, and again, it gets to this question of how do you sharpen these networks that span across jurisdictions, disciplines, and sectors? Um, government tends to be pretty, you know, pretty parochial, pretty bounded in most parts of the US. You know, it's almost like the British model from the 12th century or something. But um, you know, in the 21st century, I think we need to find ways in which um, these different nodes within metropolitan areas and regions are able to connect in a more seamless, constant, frequent, reliable way, because that's where the magic will happen. Again, policy can support this, investment can support this, but this goes beyond government. This is not about government. This is really about the interplay of public, private, philanthropic, university, skilled workers, et cetera. And I think, you know, network effects um, are easy to talk about, hard to do, but those places that can conquer that, master that, they're gonna do quite well. And then their places, I think, are gonna be lifted up as, as we move to this next industrial order. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think we're you know excited about the, the, the opportunity to, to level up communities, cities, rural, urban you know, around the country while also reinventing some of our central business districts and turning them into central social districts. It's a fascinating time to be a, to be a placemaker, whether you're in economic development, you know, urban development or, or tourism for that matter. 
I uh, really appreciate you joining us today. I wish we could take another hour uh, to continue the conversation. I'm uh, sorry we couldn't see you, but I'm very grateful we could hear you. Uh, in terms of the thoughts you had to share, it was a great way to, to tee up this conversation. Um, from here, we're going to move into a, another session and go over to London. Uh, but before I let you go, Bruce, uh, any parting thoughts uh, you want to share with the group? No, just thank you for the opportunity. I have a face made for radio, so no one really missed anything today. And um, But this is timely. This is provocative. provocative and uh, just a, a shout out to Greg Clark, who I think is involved in your next session. Um, he's doing just brilliant work. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Bruce. Yeah, we're going to be traveling over to London next for a conversation hosted by uh, Professor Clark, along with Dr. Tim Noonan, who's the Managing Director of the Business of Cities, and Emma Frost, the chair of the UK Innovation Districts Group. So great to kind of get uh, your perspective based here in the US and now, uh, you know, move over to an another part of the world and look at uh, innovation and innovation districts uh, from a UK perspective. Um, and following that, we'll have a session and a chat with uh, uh, Stephen Pedigo, who will be sharing examples of what it takes to develop innovation economy and examples of innovation districts uh, from around the world. So thanks so much for joining us. For those of you that are in this session, we want you to now click up on the agenda icon on, on your app or your, or your desktop, um, and then you can sign in to the next, move over to the next room for the session with Greg Clark um, here that starts uh, in a minute. So thanks again for all of you joining us, and I'll see you back after the session uh, with Greg in London.